What bothered American infantrymen now was that their dearly acquired combat wisdom didn't help during the new, fast-moving advance. The formerly underground enemy was now popping up from seemingly nowhere, requiring unpractised split-second responses. Some appeared from what Marines called spider holes, because, as one would explain, you couldn't believe a human being could fit into such a tiny space. Spider holes seemed to be everywhere. Their openings, covered with leaves or branches, were often undetectable until a Japanese fired and disappeared again. The enemy soldier after enemy soldier Whittaker's company shot in June did not win its members much sense of security. You're crossing a field of grass up to your waist, advancing in a good line, when somebody suddenly stands up 30 yards away. Is he armed? Is he bait? Does he have a Nambu strapped to his back? Then another pair of hands goes up, and another. And it's scary. It happens very fast, and you better react even faster. A lot of our earlier lessons about the fortifications went out the window, because now you never knew what they'd do, surrender, blow themselves up, blow you up. Some seemed to switch from one goal to another in a fraction of a second. On watch at his machine gun as dawn approached on June 11th, Melvin Hecht saw a gang of Japanese charge over the sandy ridge where his squad was dug in. Their shouts curdled blood. Banzai! Marine! You die! Hecht readied to mow them all down, but the machine gunner's dream turned to nightmare when sand jammed the gun, and his rifle too. One screaming charger dived straight for him. He was certain his time had come until other squad members opened up and killed some twenty Japanese as close as five yards from the position. Hecht discovered the man who'd dived at him had no rounds in his chamber, just a bayonet. If he'd had a single bullet, I wouldn't be writing this his memoir today. Fresh excrement in the scrub put Whittaker's senses under huge strain until he shot its maker or moved out of rifle range. One of his patrols brought him to a Japanese field hospital as hurriedly makeshift as the one where Tadashi Kojo rested during his withdrawal from Shuri. A pathetically emaciated patient lay prostrate on a bunk, waiting for an American corpsman's examination. The picture of defeat seemed too weak to move, until he pulled a grenade from his loincloth, jerked out its pin, and hit it on his fist to detonate it. A member of Whittaker's team shot him before he could throw it, corroborating yet again the detestable dictum that the only good Japanese soldier was a dead one. They had never fought in ordinary ways. Now, gouged from their fortifications, they could be counted on only to do something crazy. The 32nd Army's crazy behaviour now was caused by its squeeze between the obligations of the national military ethic and the extremely unequal battle conditions. Over 60,000 men had been killed in May, in ways much like those that wore down Tadashi Kojo's battalion, whose reduction to the dozen survivors mirrored the losses of most others defending the Shuri line. The ability of some Wehrmacht units defending Normandy the previous summer to hold out and even counter-attack, despite appalling casualties deeply impressed Allied commanders. But many German weapons, unlike the Japanese, were better than the corresponding Allied ones and the panzer divisions that fought with extraordinary skill and tenacity, despite their dismal prospects, did not nearly match the Japanese feat of endurance now, when most troops were living with their own excrement, drinking muddy water from bomb craters, dying of gangrene. Perhaps only a Japanese army could have sustained some 75% casualties, 72,000 in number, in two months of fighting without mutinying. The wonder wasn't that organisation and discipline were deteriorating in early June, but that they'd remained intact so long. But the something essential that changed with Ushijima's decision to withdraw from the Shuri line shook even units less shattered than Kojo's. Captain Koichi Ito, whose battalion had made the only successful advance in the ill-fated May 4th counter-offensive, was among the regular field officers determined to continue inspiring his men with a display of the old composure and confidence. Pride in being Japanese and self-respect as an army officer kept the persona of Kojo's haughty academy classmate intact. When we lost comrades, we were certain we would follow them sooner or later. Of course we held our lives dear, but our deepest wish was not to be captured. The wounded were sometimes killed to prevent that when we withdrew.
Some were weak, some dishonourable, as in any human group. But I was determined to give all I had for the sake of Japan and the Imperial Army. The importance the Japanese attached to their leaders helped keep a relatively high percentage of battalion commanders alive, but many, like Kojo, were too physically and mentally exhausted to radiate the prescribed confidence. And without similar shielding, a great proportion of subordinate officers, including the lieutenants and junior captains serving as company commanders, weren't alive. That was extremely detrimental to morale because a leaderless Japanese unit wasn't considered a unit at all. Thus, the 32nd Army's great losses and last-minute reorganisations had a kind of multiplier effect on the plummeting spirits. Many men were beyond being inspired in any case. No people were more moved by symbols than the Japanese. In this case, the pluck, resolve, strength and ability to prevail over richer Westerners that was symbolised by holding on to the Shuri line, which was also some compensation for their enormous losses. The shock and pain of evacuating it stripped many of their moral stamina, just as exit from the last of the major fortifications stripped them of their best, as they saw it, their only protection. Psychological study would later establish that the critical cause of combat stress is duration, even more than severity. All men, including the best and bravest, eventually break under relentless emotional and physical strain. A solid month of unrelieved combat produced some degree of battle fatigue in nearly 100% of American troops. Those who fought on Okinawa needed no research for that, knowing the importance of their withdrawals from the line for rest. It was a shining credit to regular officers like Kojo and to Japanese society in general that so few of the defenders cracked, although they had none or it was a condemnation of that society, since far more would have lived if officers and senior soldiers hadn't been blindly loyal. In any case, their resolve began snapping now. The rarity of friendly artillery's dulcet roar was another dark sign, as well as a tactical deprivation. A few of the 10% of Japanese big guns not destroyed or abandoned were broken down into pieces for transport farther south, where they would not fire again. An infantry unit on the dismal evacuation trek came upon a single heavy gun still intact. Its crew was struggling to tug it, inches at a time, through the deep mud of a devastated road in a driving rain, a sight that again symbolised to viewers the impoverishment of their inner resources too. The proud Yamato men who had sacrificed so much found the current situation almost incomprehensible. Without necessarily believing the brave would live and the cowardly die, they had expected to see some evidence that the side of the brave and virtuous would be rewarded. The decimation of the 12th Independent Infantry Battalion had begun on L Day, near the landing beaches. The bombing and shelling, whose purpose seemed to be to destroy not only humans but also the last ant, dismayed Private Kenjiro Matsuki. After ten days, 350 of the battalion's proud 1,500 men remained. They retreated, one unit eventually to a vital strong point at Maeda, two miles north of Shuri and a mile west of Kochi. Not long before the last of Kojo's force there was overrun, that unit withdrew, eventually to a shelter from which a group of soldiers made a night attack. Private Matsuki watched them leave under cover of darkness to assault an enemy-held escarpment. After the booming order of attack, he heard machine gun fire from the American position, then a howling of woo and oh-wee, a tragically heroic sound that lasted for several minutes while the enemy machine guns continued firing. Most dying soldiers Matsuki had previously seen called for their mothers, rather than making the glorious shouts of army hype. But now he actually heard a chorus of the celebrated emperor, Banzai. That night, for the very first and perhaps the last time, I heard the brave words, seemingly jerked out by some great force. He would later learn that sixty of the assault's ninety men were killed. Then the former first baseman, an independent spirit by Japanese standards, retreated farther with three others, moving at night, hard pushed by the American advance that would resume in the morning, ready to use their hand grenades. A blazing machine gun stopped them on their way, 
and they hid in a rain-filled bomb crater until the flares lost some of their power near dawn, and the heavenly gift of a morning mist offered a hint of protection. Matsuki led the way in another dash of some three hundred yards to a possibly more permanent hiding place. The machine gun didn't fire again. We'd stayed in the crater so long that maybe the enemy got tired of waiting or thought we died there. If Kojo had to fight tears when confronted by his former trainee with the fresh amputation, such sights understandably shook the non-professional soldiers even more. The forced abandonment of masses of wounded during the retreat dealt another great blow to morale. It struck hardest at veterans of victorious campaigns in China and elsewhere, where they used to dash to injured buddies and carry them back for treatment. But even newcomers to combat were mortified by failing the wounded now. When a flare suddenly ignited directly over four litter-bearers carrying a man they didn't know, they dropped their burden and ran. We didn't feel sorry for the stranger. We didn't think about helping him. We only thought about saving our own lives. A warrant officer lamented that an animal instinct of survival prevailed. When an older recruit had grieved over his first witness death in April, a lieutenant objected. Hundreds, no, thousands of you will be blown off the face of the earth, he snapped. Be resigned to that fate. Still, friends had been able to offer some sort of care during April and May. Now good men were pained and shamed by being reduced to deserting the injured. Almost all serious wounds made brave men frightened ones a transformation hastened by the state of the medical care. Although most of the great numbers of wounded left behind did not live to spread their gloom, those determined to join the withdrawal made up for them, and were as likely to receive indifference or coldness as compassion from soldiers of other units. An actor named Masao Murata had been performing with a respected theatre in Japan when he was drafted a second time, after a four-year shift in Manchuria. On Sugar Loaf, a grenade gashed the staunch Patriot's back and right hip on May 16th, the day before Dick Whitaker was hit in the hand. When Murata's unit was ordered to retreat, he was abandoned, in his own word, with two dried biscuits. His departing comrades gave assurances they would return to fetch him, but he knew their retreat would make that impossible. Once infected, his wounds became grotesquely swollen. Of course no one returned. The struggle for survival was beginning to extinguish all sense of unity and common purpose. A colonel on the other side of Shuri from Sugarloaf made a selection for Kirikomi, suicidal hand-to-hand -hand combat, at that same time. His picked unit used to shout Banzai, going into battle, but now a chatter of teeth echoed in its cave. Most of the twenty men the colonel selected were seriously wounded, therefore chilled with fear like Murata who'd thought more about what he owed the Emperor than about his own welfare, until his injuries punctured his courage, allowing the most terrifying fear of being left behind to penetrate. While Whitaker's first wound was being treated at the battalion aid station north of Sugar Loaf, Murata crawled down from his hill and wandered alone for three full days. On the fourth, he met two heavily bandaged soldiers. Good luck, because he could ask where they'd been treated. The field hospital they cited, more good luck for not all soldiers of other units volunteered such information, was a cave dug into the side of a nearby hill. Murata dragged himself there, but was turned away because that facility didn't serve his regiment. His bloated hip untreated, he begged through his pain, again in vain. Then an officer happened by who recognised the talented actor from an appearance entertaining the troops just before El Day. Salvation! The lancing and bandaging of his hip gave Murata great relief. Told to move on when they were completed, he began limping from the cave between rows of softly moaning patients with amputated limbs, who gave the former actor an inspiration. Moaning, too, he managed to squeeze in among them, and even to get a bowl of thin rice soup. The next morning, a medical officer told the patients they'd be leaving after dark because Americans were advancing on the cave. The non-ambulatory were to take the appropriate action, but no means for kamikame were distributed, and Murata stood at the head of the procession leaving the cave at nightfall. A stick given him by a nurse served as a cane, 
but his useless right leg caused so many falls in the rain and slimy mud that he soon found himself at the rear, walking on his buttocks and hoping the dirt wouldn't finish him off by reinfecting his hip. Alone again and moving only by night, he took forty-eight hours to crawl three miles to a village midway to his destination. That was a good pace for the thousands of crawlers, many of whom took three to four nights to cover the same distance. He kept going another two nights, his mouth now too blistered to touch his hardtack. But of all his tortures, the greatest were thirst and the thought of dying alone. By now, all medical facilities except a few in the extreme south were in no better condition than those visited by Murata and Captain Kojo. With no means of evacuating the wounded even if a hospital ship had magically arrived, all Japanese casualties had been treated on the island or not treated. Some amputated their own limbs. The luckiest reached the Heiberu Army Hospital, where young Ruriko Morishita worked as a nurse's aide. Medic Ikuo Ogiso was attached to a smaller facility, the second field hospital. During its operation in the north, highly motivated Ogiso's diligence and dedication had won him promotion to private first class. Then a wing was moved to below the landing beaches, and now, in June, it was again moved farther south. Under a blanket of enemy bombs and shells, Ogiso's nighttime search for the designated new cave took him from horror to horror. His despair increased when he managed to find the right one, a foul hole whose walls and ceiling oozed moisture. Two days later, thirty patients were delivered to that hospital, habitation of which would have been a danger even to men in perfect health. There were of course no sanitation arrangements. Soon over two hundred gravely wounded soldiers were crammed into rock and mud thick with excrement. The dungeon-like grotto's squalor was lit by the flames of occasional oil lamps that cast weird shadows of stalactites on soldiers, who were lying almost on top of each other, all looking like creatures suffering the torments of hell. Sounds of weeping, groaning and shrieking, as some wounded became deranged, echoed from the walls and through the nauseating, suffocating smell of their sweat, blood, pus and wastes. The luckiest patients lay where they could wet their throats by holding their mouths open to catch drops from the ceiling. The others remained racked with thirst on top of their excruciating wounds, swarming with flies and maggots. Each time the bandages are changed, white maggots as thick as a child's little fingertip dropped from the gaping wounds, hundreds of them, all sucking the bloody pus. Medical supplies were so quickly exhausted that the word treatment became a euphemism. All we could do was to disinfect the wound, place medicated gauze over the spot and bandage it. Soon bandages could be changed only every second day, then every third, although patients whose turns were postponed wept with pain. When the borax ran out, the eyes of a blinded soldier, thought to be a graduate of the prestigious Imperial University, were washed with plain water. Soon the tiny space held an inconceivable 270 people, jammed side by side. The horror paralysed the medical officer, a former paediatrician who had gone into a stupor at his first sight of the unoccupied cave. Now he lay immobilised there, his eyes closed and body rigid. In his civilian life, Private Ogiso had also been a working actor. Now, with only a medic's sketchy medical training, he became a de facto surgeon, cutting open and sewing up a stream of wounded men because no one else could. Amputation was by saw, without anaesthesia or antiseptics. Other wounded begged for admission, but, as at other facilities, were turned away, unless they belonged to units served by that wing of the hospital. Inside, a partition was constructed beneath the lower bunks for tetanus patients, doomed by lack of serum. It was worse than a pigsty built over the quagmire of blood and pus. Meanwhile, the untreated gangrene cases tossed about in unbearable agony as their limbs turned dark and swelled grotesquely. They screamed for days, It hurts! Please kill me! before going rigid. A patient who blew himself up with a hand grenade also killed the man next to him. If cave medicine hadn't been one of the battle's dirty secrets, it might have provided the starkest measure of the inequality of the two sides' resources. Ninety percent of the Japanese on Okinawa would die before learning it. As American fire turned caves into crematoria, 
The non-wounded, too, trudged south in a daze, dumb with accumulated horrors, bereft of hope that any effort now could produce even momentary tactical success. The remaining goal of fighting to the last man to give the mainland more time and its people more inspiration had lost much of its meaning. Kenjiro Matsuki sensed that the battle had virtually ended, and this was mainly a mop-up of us remnants. His decimated unit walked in silence, like sheep heading for a slaughterhouse. The ambulatory patients of the main branch of Ogiso's field hospital, evacuating inch by inch in the driving rain and thick mud, seemed the chilling sight of defeat itself. A few soldiers comforted themselves with a rumour that they were going south to be picked up by submarine and taken home to Japan. Others still talked of the massive Japanese landing, now promised by some officers for late June. But the sight of other units as wasted as their own further unnerved them. The clearing weather made retreating units prime targets. Salvos from an American battleship caught a transport company that had set out with 150 vehicles. It arrived with fewer than 30. The bluish flash of a large explosion silhouetted a platoon entering a southern village. When the soldiers of another unit reached the spot, we saw nothing, nobody. Our fighting men had disappeared from the face of the earth like a dream. An exhausted soldier of the 15th Independent Mixed Regiment was dragging a badly wounded leg on June 1st when he ran into Colonel Seiko Mita, his regimental commander. The de facto leader of Sugarloaf's magnificent defence was walking as if he'd lost his mind. The regiment of some 5,000 men was down to about 20, roughly 1% of its fighting strength. Now the first deserters began slipping away, some in civilian clothes, a few with the look of wild dogs, as a frightened soldier saw them. By mid-June, the worst-off units would be a rabble skulking in holes and trenches, in a journalist's words, wandering the countryside looking for food and water. Although some 25,000 Japanese, numerically a full division, were still coming, going and hiding in the remaining patch of friendly land, many from broken units hardly knew their fellow soldiers' names. As they became the loneliest of crowds, some would turn on civilians and even soldiers from other units, fighting them for food and shelter. The post-Shuri Japanese reorganisation had been largely a paper operation. In the field, it was too late for anything but last-minute preparations, except for units that settled into installations established earlier, most importantly by the 9th Division in the last high ground two miles short of the island's southern tip. Elsewhere, field commanders lacked the time and resources even to properly provision their new positions. Apart from that last mountain spine and the ridges leading to it, much of the south was too flat for defensive strongpoints. Although even more caves dotted the limestone and coral than up north, they were too few and raw for the remnants of Ushijima's army, not to mention a far greater number of civilians equally eager for shelter. Men who'd grown to hate the old sanctuaries in and around Shuri remembered them with longing. Even the lesser installations there had drainage, levelled floors and some ventilation. Schoolteacher Shigemi Furukawa noted the difference, starting with the disappearance of a town that had earlier delighted him. Most southern caves and holes in the ground were equally craggy and creepy. A few days of frantic digging in early June managed to slightly improve a selection of them, but many remained pitch-black dungeons, their fetid atmospheres suffocating their packed occupants. Rank moisture dripped from stalactites that left ceilings too low to stand, even when their tips were chopped off. The floors were pools of ooze or coral, too jagged for sitting or lying on without pain. But although every surface was wet, drinking water was rarely available, or was polluted by the waste of dozens of men who were no longer willing to dash out into the rain of metal even to relieve themselves. The new 32nd Army Headquarters cave was better, partly because it was on a tall cliff above the village of Mabuni. The long, twisting cave near the summit of Hill 89, as the approaching Americans would name the cliff, had a spectacular view of the Pacific from the mouth facing it. But even it was a far cry from the elaborate tunnel beneath Shuri Castle. In the field, the shortage of water was even more critical than of ammunition. A soldier wounded near Kakazu felt like a dead man because, 
I became a slave to the desire for water. I was crazy with thirst. That was in April, and in a medical cave. When the days turned fiercely hot in June, and water provisioning became as erratic as all other, thirst became unbearable, especially when the fear of slaughter grew intense. While the great American logistical operation delivered water, however foul-tasting, in trucks that drove almost to the front, Japanese were ceaselessly tormented, even in sectors temporarily free of fighting. Hunger was less insistent. Those with rice often had to cook it in the muddy liquid of stagnant puddles, soldiers taking turns blowing at the pine needles that served for fuel until their lungs nearly burst. Carbon monoxide caused cooks to drop utensils without being aware of it. The sea rations disdained by Americans represented supreme luxury to soldiers who found the leavings on nocturnal forays. Some lived weeks in their cavities, their mud growing ever thicker with the wastes in which they slept, squeezed together and almost submerged, a number literally suffocated to death. So this was how we were to breathe our last, trapped in a hole without air, without water, without the space to kneel and pray during one's final moments, an inhabitant would remember. The shelling of the few square miles still in Japanese hands naturally became more concentrated, even Americans who blessed each shell thought the dawn-to-dusk bombardment awesome, at a time when the word retained much of its original meaning. One of the rare Japanese who now wanted to surrender carefully chose a place that promised the best chance without being hit or shot by his fellows. But he found it impossible to walk ten steps on the first road leading there. Another was convinced the low-flying Grummans and Chance Vorts their pilots, now hardly inconvenienced by anti-aircraft fire, were determined not to miss a single ant with their bombing and strafing. That was no mere hyperbole of the terrified. Samuel Hines flew his four 500-pound bombs, eight rockets, and many belts of machine-gun ammunition from the Kadena airfield to Dashi Kojo had originally been assigned to defend. When his squadron inaugurated night attacks in May, any light, a truck's headlights, a fire, a lighted doorway, was to be fired on. One night, he looked around for something to attack. Somebody boiling a pot of tea or lighting his way to the toilet, but I could see nothing. After Heinz's last strike, on June 19th, against some trivial target, he assured the squadron intelligence officer he'd scored a direct hit on a three-hole privy. Just as Japanese field commanders had feared, their units, virtually unsupported by artillery, were far less effective than at the Shuri line. When men did sortie from their refugees, they were less skilled at concealment, many making themselves easy targets by running from their makeshift positions when they were shelled by American tanks. Most saw themselves as the objects of a roundup. This went beyond any concept of war, an analytically inclined gunner observed. This was sheer one sided destruction and killing. The dire conditions and prospects now begat dissension. If fighting Americans still engaged in inter-service and even inter-unit rivalry, it was naturally far more common among the men facing annihilation. Japanese soldiers had to be part of a unit to eat with it. Straggling groups from Kojo's 22nd Infantry Regiment would share none of their food with men from a sister regiment of the same 24th Division. Although only a small percentage were truly demoralised at this stage, an infection of spirit began speeding their inevitable end. It spread easily in the many caves that housed remnants of several units, then attacked the cohesion that had bound each together as a fighting unit. One man watched his infantry company disintegrate in morale, discipline and even sanity. Previous losses had been heaviest among the bravest and best, now the survivors saw the units had ceased to exist, as one would put it. Some feared fellow soldiers, who, for example, would rage against all cooking because smoke might escape from the mouth of the cave and reveal its position. Clicks exchanged death threats. There wasn't a shred of law or order among us, a wretched soldier would remember. No one outside one's little group cared what happened to anyone else. The inevitability of death did not eliminate fear of it. Even more than the Americans, most Japanese felt they were alive only through a series of amazing reprieves, squatting an inch or second away from a bullet, being shielded by a fellow soldier's body, 
knowing someone with access to medical treatment. When the field hospital, where the former actor Masao Murata's wounded hip had been given its skimpy treatment disbanded, he crawled toward the cliff where he'd waited to crush the fainted American landing on L-Day 12 weeks earlier. Four days later, he was again near collapse, having had no food since the rice soup he'd wangled in the hospital cave. But he drank his fill at a well he found, and there was saved by another stroke of luck. Villagers who came to draw water that night recognised the mud-covered heap. Helping him to a tomb, they fed him horse meat and white rice, very rare those days. Although the feast after his fast caused severe diarrhoea, he savoured a day of blissful peace from enemy fire, gazing at a blue sky, until a child reported the approach of Americans. Soon he and the civilians heard their Detekoi, Detekoi! The civilians hid him behind some urns in a corner of the tomb and spread a kimono over him. Slashing rice sacks with knives, the Americans twice shone a flashlight into Murata's corner. But they finally left, and he escaped into the hills with a hope of making his way to the north to join a Japanese force supposedly still operating there. The unswerving patriot would continue to believe Japan would win the war until he was taken prisoner and saw American supply depots. But like much of the 32nd Army in June, he could hardly be called a fighting man. Murata's terror of a lonely death helped explain the increasing incidence of Japanese frenzy. Extreme stress gripped the many separated from their dead or otherwise departed comrades, in the sense that the desperate loners didn't know what they would do at their final moments, Whitaker's fear of the weak but unpredictable remnants as maniacal was justified. As for the majority still with their units, their central experience was waiting for the onslaught to approach their positions. Many saw their final action shortly before their caves were actually straddled. Sent out to seek hand-to-hand -hand combat with the enemy, some rushed tanks as human mines with a dozen or more hand grenades wrapped in a blanket. Their last orders were much like those given near a village some two miles north of the 32nd Army's final headquarters at Mabuni. Tonight we go out to the top of Gushichan Heights, an artillery officer declared on June 10th. I assume you are ready. The time has come to give your life for the country and the emperor. No matter what dangers had been previously faced, very few were prepared for a superior's announcement that the time had come for the inevitable end. Some caves actually echoed with chattering teeth. Older men removed photographs of their wives and children from their belongings and stared at them. Their tears irritated some younger soldiers. How can you fight in that frame of mind? The scattering who returned from such sorties sometimes met disgust from their officers. How dare you come back alive? Norio Watanabe's independence of spirit put him among the even smaller number who tried to save themselves by fleeing the battle entirely. The anti-aircraft battery of the Osaka photographer who had opposed the war from the beginning had been reduced to nearly nothing. His friends had been pulverised in front of his eyes. Whole gun crews had been blown to bits, in one case so thoroughly that the only residue was a gob of innards hanging from a cave's ceiling support. Escaping from a particularly bloody shelling now, Watanabe climbed a hill near his cave in order to be alone. The military oddball, long sickened by the futility and stupidity of fighting, was also unusual in having married for love, not by arrangement. But with death so near, it was time to dispose of his personal possessions. He put a match to a letter from his adored wife, the only one delivered to him during his year on Okinawa, and to his own photographs of his cherished daughters. Tears wet his cheeks as flames consumed his treasures. His only consolation was a thought that loss of this miserable war was Japan's best hope to free herself of the emperor cult that had dragged her into it. The battery was further devastated by enemy fire and death charges, but to Watanabe's amazing good luck, his squad leader happened to have attended an American university, and to his astonishment, the unusually broad-minded man revealed he intended to escape. Better to be shot for deserting than to die like a dog fighting for an ugly cause. Watanabe and four trusted fellow soldiers laid plans to island hop to Formosa. Some dropped out or were killed before they could start. The others left with an Okinawan guide and crept south in search of a canoe, 
even more afraid of discovery by fellow soldiers than of American bombardments. They wandered, staggered, fled from terrifying dangers, repaired discarded canoes and saw them stolen, were split up by yet more dangers and risked several other attempts at surrender. Eventually, a chance meeting with another group planning escape put Watanabe in a canoe in the East China Sea. Yet another miracle saved him after a near typhoon swamped the fragile craft. He landed on Kume Island, some 50 miles east of Naha, the birthplace of Masahide Ota, the fervent member of the Blood and Iron Scouts for the Emperor. Watanabe's bizarre adventures would continue on Kume, where a handful of other deserters soon landed. But their total number would be tiny. He remained the rare Japanese exception. Early June's stiffest resistance took place on the Oroku Peninsula, which curves into the East China Sea from just below Naha. That was where the abandoned headquarters of Captain Kojo's 22nd Regiment adjoined the much more elaborate tunnel complex housing the headquarters of the naval base force of some 9,000 troops, including Okinawan conscripts, all but a few of whom were untrained or poorly trained for land warfare. In late May, its commander, Admiral Minoru Ota, complied with a request from General Ushijima to join the general withdrawal. The naval garrison, reduced by the fighting to roughly half its original size, destroyed most of its equipment and heavy weapons, then trudged some five miles south to a position roughly parallel to the crossroads village of Makabe, through which great numbers of Japanese units, including Kojo's, would stagger to their final positions. But its planned emplacements turned out to be so exposed that some of Otter's senior officers pleaded to return to their original fortifications, arguing that they belonged to the Imperial Japanese Navy. Until then, the Admiral had been a model of rarely achieved inter-service cooperation. No doubt influenced by the general demoralisation, he permitted half his troops to return to the peninsula and accompanied them. On the American side, 10th Army staff debated whether to take the peninsula by pushing through its hills, as Conservative General Buckner wanted, or by an amphibious landing. Fortunately for the troops involved, the more audacious approach was chosen. Units of the 6th Marine Division, including those that had just cleared Naha, landed in the pre-dawn darkness of June 4th, Dick Whittaker's 29th Regiment following later the same morning. The first three days were relatively easy, even for the units assigned to take Naha airfield, although Whittaker's second serious wounding occurred there on June 6th. Most of Admiral Ota's armament was waiting in hilly areas farther inland, chiefly hundreds of machine guns and light cannon transferred from anti-aircraft positions and stripped from wrecked planes. Those guns and a variety of landmines were very effective, even for troops scarcely trained in their use. The motley units held up the advance, eventually of eight marine battalions supported by tanks, for over a week. American casualties mounted to a greater proportion even than at Shuri, although the total, 1,608, was far smaller. That was more evidence of how a better equipped defence would have rent the Americans, as it was preparing to do on the Japanese mainland. As it was, the naval base force shared the fate of the rump of the 32nd Army as a whole. Ota's troops, green as they were in combat, would have meted out much more punishment in the same battle before the general withdrawal. Now most of their armament and supplies had been destroyed or dispersed elsewhere. Marines finally forced the survivors of the hill clashes down into an area of mudflats and paddies. When they surrounded them, Japanese-speaking Americans shouted inducements to surrender. Some replied by requesting permission for a ceasefire so that they could kill themselves in peace. Permission was granted, and Marines applauded the more spectacular performers, including a pair who sat on a large demolition charge and lit the fuse. Scores who couldn't decide what to do were easily cut down, bringing the total Japanese dead on the peninsula to about 5,000. Ota sent his last message to Ushijima on the night of June 11th. Those at our position will all die honourably. Thank you for your past kindnesses. Wish you a victory. The Admiral ordered his senior doctor to make certain that 300 badly wounded troops suffered no further and had an honourable death. Walking down long rows of wounded, 
The medical team methodically injected outstretched arms until the only sound was the team's own sobbing. A marine unit found Ota's headquarters on June 13th. The bodies in the medical centre were supplemented by hundreds of deaths in the tunnels and corridors. The Admiral and five senior officers lay on sleeping platforms in a room near the centre of the complex, their uniforms freshly pressed, their throats neatly slit. Ota's death poem expressed a kind of contentment. Elsewhere in Japanese-held territory, the gravely wounded were also dying by their own or their fellows' hands. The American ratio of 97 saved for every hundred wounded was almost reversed in caves like that of Medic Ikuo Ogiso. Its agonies continued until it too was disbanded and patients able to limp or crawl were told to make their way back to their units. The seemingly catatonic medical officer did not answer Ogiso's questions about what might be done to save their non-ambulatory patients. Finally, the private had to assume that duty too. His announcement that those unable to return to their companies must die produced absolute silence. Then the injured started to stir. One missing a leg crawled out. Another broke apart his cot to make a cane and tottered out. To my astonishment, serious cases who until now were considered immobile demonstrated a frightening tenacity to stay alive by crawling inch by inch toward the exit through the mud of blood and pus on the ground. Ogiso gave three choices to the remaining 80-plus. He helped the majority who chose potassium cyanide to lie with their heads pointed north, the customary position for the dead. Gunfire could be heard advancing toward the cave as he administered the injections one by one. Death was almost instantaneous. When one was done, the next very gently extended his arm toward me. Then he carried others who yearned for a last breath of clean air outside the cave to a sky unexpectedly brilliant with stars after May's incessant rain. Their heads were also pointed northward. A jar with a few swallows of water was placed in easy reach, together with three hand grenades, because the dampness of the cave had probably spoiled a good percentage of them. Ogiso told them to do what they had to when the enemy appeared. Badly wounded patients who declined death were sometimes shot. In the village of Gushichan, two miles north of the 32nd Army's final headquarters, a non-commissioned officer saw to that as the enemy approached. Even some starkly vivid Japanese accounts of the hardships on Okinawa omit such episodes, because their writers felt it would have been too cruel to reveal to families that their men died at the hands of their own superiors. With no doubt that the turn of all the living was imminent, or that death was the highest virtue, Ogiso felt no misgivings. But decades later, he would look at the hands that so faithfully followed his orders, and feel an urge to throw myself on the ground and weep. In resumed torrential rain, he set out for a new cave, where several scattered branches of what was still called the Second Field Hospital reunited, Requisitions for reinforcements for fighting units soon reduced the staff of some 250 medical personnel to about a quarter of that. Others failed to return after their dispatch as messengers to the 24th Division's headquarters cave, two and a half miles away. Ogiso, however, survived his stints of sprinting and crawling under the rain of bombs, until their own cave was surrounded and the chief medical officer ordered him to report their end in a final dash to headquarters. Knowing he'd be shot as he inched from the mouth, Ogiso nevertheless moved to a bay when a compassionate superior saved him. He was a lieutenant who, reasoning that division headquarters had already been destroyed, suggested he pretend to have made the trip and safely returned. Ogiso's experience was as typical as any of the medical service survivors, again the luckiest few. The second field hospital, more a mass tomb than a medical facility by early June, was dismantled just when tens of thousands of gravely wounded most needed care. Not even that, however, prompted significant questioning of the system in which the sufferers were locked. Civilian suffering. Some hundred thousand civilians remained behind the Shuri line when the major assault on it was mounted on May 11th. Their confidence in the 32nd Army and inability to think of an alternative kept them there even after the strict orders to evacuate to the scarcely defended, little bombarded Shinan Peninsula on the east coast. The Japanese withdrawal, in effect, pronounced sentence on them. 
that wasn't unexpected. A. Shimada, governor of the prefecture of Okinawa, attended the May 22nd conference at which General Ushijima announced his intention to withdraw. Unlike many Japanese officials sent down from Tokyo, Shimada sympathized deeply with the Okinawan people and begged Ushijima not to abandon his main fortifications. He even called the plan foolish because it would condemn untold thousands of non-combatants to death, whatever its military value. After the withdrawal, he went further, accusing the army of having caused needless slaughter. Ushijima would reply that his primary mission was to give the mainland more time to prepare for the enemy invasion. It's true that he was admirably following his orders to prolong the battle for that reason by every possible day, and brilliantly in the withdrawal itself, although Colonel Yahara, his operations officer, did the actual planning. And it's hard to imagine a more impressive display of dignity and composure than Ushijima's in the face of impossible odds. He was a great commander of whom it cannot be said he betrayed the Okinawan people, because Imperial General Headquarters had treated them as expendable from the beginning. A sacrificial stone, as a distinguished Japanese military historian would put it, in the game of Go. More than supreme courage, it would have taken revolutionary initiative, the vision of a rebel prophet, for Ushijima to surrender when the Shuri line was broken instead of prolonging the mutual killing. But had he found the strength for that, he would have been a greater man, and in the long run, a greater commander. Of all candidates who might fail his superiors, however, Ushijima was among the least likely. The exemplary general gave Japan four extra weeks by protracting the efforts of some of his 40,000 surviving soldiers and causing the deaths of almost three times as many civilians. For decades after his death, it was said on Okinawa and repeated by Japanese and American writers that that filled him with remorse. The Okinawans must resent me terribly, he was quoted as reflecting in his final moments but that supposed flash of guilt may well have been invented by a sympathiser of Japan trying to make him nobler than he was, to preserve respect for samurai traditions and Japanese militarism despite the agony they caused. Or the story expressed a wish by someone who grieved for Okinawans, whose suffering might be more bearable if Ushijima had regretted how much his strategy had contributed to it. Current evidence indicates that for all his good nature and soldierly virtue, the Stoic general thought no more about them at the end than at the beginning. The island remained the stage, not an actor, in his Japanese drama of defending personal honour with sacrificial service. However more likeable he was than the long line of exploiters from Satsuma and elsewhere, his notion of right and wrong left no more room for native considerations. The campaign's final stage would now surpass the sum of the island's suffering during the previous three and a half centuries. Most Okinawan leaders contributed by following their old pattern of docile submission to Japanese authority. Scores of thousands might have been saved had they heeded the American leaflets rained on them. Wear white, keep apart from military units, give themselves up. But the majority, still convinced the bestial Americans lusted for their death, were too bewildered to do more than grope for safety in the same eight square miles where the remnants of the Japanese army were hiding and charging. The civilian slaughter predicted by Governor Shimada began within days of the withdrawal. Had the 32nd Army held to its promise and remained in its main bastion for the final stand, it would have been destroyed to the last man, but a large number of civilians would have been spared because most were apart from the army, therefore relatively safe. Now the two streamed together on the roads leading south, seeking cover in the same places. In the north and centre, where many non-combatants were quickly interned and fed, however minimally, their suffering had remained within what might be called expected limits. But there was no way civilians could stay alive after mingling with the troops. Prodigious as it had been before, American fire from land, sea and air became more so on the compressed target of the southern end. Almost seven million shells alone in June, roughly fifty for each surviving Okinawan and Japanese. Dodging that fire, hordes of desperate natives limped and crawled without the slightest idea of a destination. Older ones who had rarely left their villages were lost in unfamiliar territory. 
Almost all were hungry, thirsty, and weak enough to bend or reel under the smallest bundles. They scattered in panic when bombardments began, some clawing their way into ditches and brush, but thousands were too exhausted to move. The army of refugees that choked the muddy ribbons of road was much larger than the shrunken 32nd Army. Their meagre belongings, scraps of clothing and a piece or two of pottery, were piled in baskets on their heads or hung on shoulder poles. A schoolteacher on his way from the village of the disbanding field hospital Captain Kojo visited during his evacuation found words inadequate to describe the utter horror. Dead everywhere, everywhere, it was hell. Almost all of the travelling was still done after dark, in rotting shoes or none at all. The steady deluge of the first nights filled trenches, ditches and all manner of craters. Occasional car or truck headlights illuminated ghostly faces ravaged by exhaustion and fear. Centuries-old villages were piles of stones and ashes. The flesh and fat of people hit by shells sizzled in the darkness, emitting now bluish, now reddish flames. Groups without destinations wandered on and off the roads, some turning back north in their confusion. A teenage girl saw women and children disappear among some bushes, only to re-emerge a few moments later, striding resolutely in the opposite direction, as though headed for a new destination. During the day, the bodies that littered roads and fields bloated under the searing sun that replaced the rain. Elderly couples sat in the mud, holding hands with their last strength while awaiting their end. A Japanese soldier saw a mother and her child squatting in a field, their hands covering their faces until they vanished in the flash and smoke of a shell burst, one of thousands of direct hits on unintended targets. Women screamed watching flames roast their children. A few fathers, most were still in the home guard, joined the category of the crazed. Split in two at the hip, one stared in horror at the scraps of his wife and three children left by a naval shell. Some families lurched to their tombs to join their ancestors there. Children of five and six carried infants on their backs. Others whimpered with exhaustion as they were dragged by adults too weak to lift them. Newly made orphans crouched in terror. Wretched suffering was so ubiquitous that families came to ignore others starving to death before their eyes. A Himayuri nurse's aide from the Heberu Army Hospital noticed a stream of soldiers and civilian refugees watching a native with one leg gone. He'd just emerged from a deep puddle by stretching his other leg ahead and supporting himself with both arms. A small bag hanging by a strap from his neck thumped on his chest with each forward jerk. No one stopped to help. How many miles had he travelled like that, and how many miles had he yet to cover? Ever since Elde, what Okinawans saw contradicted everything promised by Tokyo and the 32nd Army. Enemy warships filled the ocean, enemy planes packed the sky, enemy weaponry scorched the land, and the awaited counterattack never came. Still, even the victims of occasional Japanese mistreatment almost universally suppressed their questions, while hope of eventual victory made every terrible event bearable. It was rooted in the great defensive line on which so many natives too had toiled. Even more than among the troops, Citadel Shuri, the heart of the old kingdom and of the defence, had comforted and inspired. As long as Shuri holds, as long as Ushijima and Cho command the army, victory is ours, we tell one another, and believe it. The evacuation of the never-to-be-surrendered fortress dealt a critical blow to that trust. Families on the road met other families gripped by the same disillusionment. Hearing of massive civilian deaths in other sectors, they realised their suffering had been in vain. Few ordinary folks had embraced the emperor cult, or esteemed the idea of death for him. Further sacrifice could no longer be justified in any way that made sense to them. The 32nd Army's condition, now exposed to view, further shocked and demoralised. Troops passing piles of uniformed corpses without making a move to bury them, and others disguised in civilian clothes dismayed Okinawans, previously unable to imagine Japanese cowardice. Gravely wounded men who had left the disbanded medical facilities not wanting to kill themselves, there were the starkest evidence of the military breakdown, 
more appalling even than the individual stragglers who also didn't know the location or direction of their units. Many had been crippled in both legs. The strongest inched relentlessly forward, stumbling or crawling or pulling themselves with their arms. The weakest, unable even to sit any longer, lay prostrate, waiting for oblivion. Civilians saw even unwounded troops succumb to despair. One band sat motionless across a road from a burned-out army truck, although every child knew by then that even wrecked military vehicles were a favourite target of enemy planes. Many such groups seemed beyond caring. Okinawans did not have to know how much Japanese soldiers needed firm leadership to perceive that the army was stumbling toward disintegration. All could see for themselves that some units were collections of ragged individuals, a proportion of whom, knowing they had only weeks or days to live, resorted to assault. Sharing their dangers and trust in eventual victory, natives and the army had generally gotten along well before the evacuation. But it was almost inevitable that centuries-old dislike and antagonism would re-emerge as the common objectives began breaking down, and that the majority would come to sense, if not yet vocalise, that the 32nd Army that had promised to protect them was going to lose. The claim that Japan was a divine country, destined to rule the world, was increasingly seen as myth. Competing for food, shelter and impossible salvation helped civilians lose their admiration for the formerly invincible Yamato men, whose mistreatment of them was growing from isolated instances before the withdrawal to a small but clear pattern. Long-standing prejudice against the Okinawans surfaced among more and more troops who had lost their leadership. Shorn of the restraints of their community and higher authority, some became savage. Never mind that Okinawans were Japanese citizens. That category of desperate soldiers knew them as racially non-Japanese, therefore inferior. At the same time, civilians cared less about the outcome of the battle and the war. As they trudged the perilous roads amid the masses of dead and half-living, they could think of little beyond their own survival. Their priorities were safety, water and food, roughly in that order. When the supplies on their backs were gone, sweet potato leaves became a luxury, like frogs, toads, locusts, snails, slugs and lizards. Most families resident in the far south had a cache of food even after their houses had been levelled. Refugees from elsewhere agonised over whether to steal from their fields and larders. As the weeks passed, the takers became less troubled by conscience, and those who couldn't bring themselves to steal became too weak to care about nourishment. Nursing children were the first to succumb to starvation. When mothers' breasts ran dry, some melted mashed sweet potatoes in boiling water, but the babies vomited up the liquid. Soon the yellow clay dolls stopped crying and turned cold. Grandparents were usually next. Families argued about eating sago palms, which would poison them but only after a few days. Others debated whether to leave their caves to try to scavenge something in the fields, the effort of which might kill them faster by consuming their remaining energy. Water, always scarce in the south in summer, became all but unavailable when May's rain turned to June's heat and drought. Few refugees knew the locations of springs, most of which had been sequestered by Japanese units anyway. Some drank their own urine. By mid-June, Ushijima's troops, with and without orders from superiors, commandeered many areas' hiding places, making safety, the first priority, impossible for civilians. After dragging themselves south, all had to find shelter from the typhoon of bombs and steel. The only reliable kind was in the caves that belonged to local communities no less than the wells. In fact, many caves were the sites of the wells, the fresh water that had formed them serving as the only local supply. Living for two months in the caves farther north, the severely distressed people who had been trying to cling to life in the enormously overcrowded spaces inevitably got on one another's nerves. Women stopped menstruating and otherwise lost the last particle of their female charms, as a native account put it, becoming physiologically identical with men. Ventures outside were made only for food, for which all searched with the sensitive noses of hungry animals, and for excreting. That function was fraught with distress because it inevitably exposed the performers to shell fragments. Latrine trenches began mere yards from cave exits, 
Excrement overflowed their walls because the stress on top of a diet heavy with unhulled rice balls made by dirty hands turned stomachs sickly. But the desire to defecate was suppressed with the utmost effect, even when it filled bodies with yearning from abdomen to breast. Those were the good days, because now, farther south, soldiers expropriated many of the caves, ejecting natives already there. Refusing admission to new arrivals, they labelled protesters anti-Japanese, including those who refused to surrender their last supplies of food. Over 300 families in one Maccabi area alone were driven from four community caves in early June, after which they sought the almost useless protection of trees, pigsties, rock walls and the ruins of houses, or simply stayed in the open. Joe Nabucco Martin set the scene in an autobiographical novel. As a barrage of shells burst around her little party of civilians, they found a hillside cave near a village. The usual Japanese excuse was that Okinawans' comings and goings in search of food would reveal their hiding places, but soldiers who drove them to perish under the bombardments knew the cave mouths would be found anyway, not least because all surrounding vegetation had been charred to nothing. Those who took food intended for children usually justified the action as necessary for the national interest they supposedly represented. Who's more important, your family or the emperor? A small minority of inhumane soldiers began to dominate. Some were starving when they forced villagers to pay in food for information about what regions might be safe from the enemy. Others fired into hamlets and looted when their inhabitants rushed away to escape what they assumed were American bullets. And when Americans arrived outside cave mouths, many soldiers turned their weapons on civilians inside, threatening death if they tried to leave, hoping their presence would deter the enemy from using explosives on the caves. Needless to say, not all Japanese were cruel. Many kind-hearted soldiers couldn't help natives because their officers or comrades shouted them down. But many others did perform good deeds. A student named Momoko Yonaha was one of thousands they saved, in her case by taking the trouble, despite their own desperation, to stop her when she reached for a suicidal hand grenade on the beach at the very southern tip. After the war, a few 32nd Army survivors would return to Okinawa to live among the gentle people who had sacrificed beyond the call to save them. Many would grieve for civilians together with their dead comrades. Some still grieve, recognising that Okinawans were the real victims of this war, who bore the greatest share of its pain. But most Japanese soldiers remained locked in their ignorance, fear, upbringing and code of war, all of which tended to make them indifferent to Okinawan suffering, even when they weren't adding to it. No doubt mainland civilians would be better treated when the fighting would move there. But it never did. One of the poisoned darts of the war started by Japan was that the only battle fought on supposedly Japanese soil was actually fought on Okinawan. After centuries of Japanese effort to instill Ryukyuans with their own militaristic appetites, the military government in Tokyo caused the island some of the most severe destruction, person for person and house for house, ever suffered by any people. The failure of Ushijima's staff to take account of that disaster followed directly from Japan's colonialist attitudes and policies. The antagonism that flared up as collapse became imminent also fired accusations of Okinawan spying. That charge, grounded in a notion that any contact with the hated enemy was betrayal, had begun when the first civilians allowed themselves to be taken to American detention camps on L Day. Even without it, some soldiers shot civilians who tried to surrender, which was considered crime enough. Brutal torture and executions became numerous after the fall of Shuri. Shooting, strangling, clubbing, and tossing hand grenades at natives, including hundreds of women and children, whom Japanese had detected moving toward the American lines, with an apparent intention to let themselves be taken. Possession of an American leaflet with instructions about how to do that was often taken as proof of treachery. It may be said in mitigation that Japanese also killed fellow soldiers who attempted to surrender. American combat diaries had many entries like a Marine's on June 13th, the Japanese were offered but refused to surrender and threw grenades at two of their brothers who carried leaflets of surrender. 
but the murders of civilians were more repulsive, as in their conquests in Manchuria and China, some soldiers seemed more controlled by racial prejudice, obviously no American monopoly, than by any rational motive. Civilians were the handiest scapegoats for those driven to believe that someone was responsible for the military disaster. At least a hundred documented executions for espionage took place, all without any evidence of it, most in spontaneous outbursts of vengeful frustration, even against children. They included beheadings, sabre-slashings of traitors tied to trees, and one perforation of a feeble-minded female spy, with a bamboo spear. When the little offshore island of Iashima was stormed, a third of its 4,500 natives died, roughly 20 times the number of American combatants killed there. But American soldiers found two badly wounded teenage boys who'd survived the hand grenade blasts that had killed the rest of their families. The pair recovered in a hospital tent, from which they escaped when some Americans pressed them to go to their village and bring back some good-looking girls. Japanese soldiers from a detachment of stragglers later found them and took them to their lieutenant. You gave the Americans military secrets, he declared, then shouted an order. Swords instantly dispatched the accused. They flashed again after Americans told six young natives in a detention camp to take a letter to the same lieutenant, asking him to come down from his mountain retreat and surrender. Executed for treachery, the six died singing a patriotic song. Performed in secret, most of the other killings will never be fully documented. Ishima's suffering mirrored Okinawa's in being caused by both sides. Three months before Elde, the Japanese forced some 3,000 natives to evacuate. Weeks after the official end on Okinawa, the Americans removed all remaining civilians to improve security on the island's airfield, already gearing up for the coming invasion of the Japanese mainland. By that time, the surviving population was mainly women and children, some of whom tried to defend their demolished homes with stones and spears. Almost every building was rubble when civilians were permitted to return to their island in late 1945. Although the Japanese Ministry of Education would order mention of murders of Okinawans deleted from textbooks, the outlines are known. Members of the 32nd Army stole food, refuge and life from tens of thousands of Okinawans, chiefly women and children, whom they had supposedly come to protect. A small but significant number bayoneted, beheaded, poisoned, strangled, drowned and injected babies to silence them in the caves they'd commandeered. Atrocities were proportionately greater on lesser Ryukyu islands, whose smaller garrisons were commanded by junior officers. Before Elde, Japanese commanders ordered all residents of the Yayami Islands, a small chain about 265 miles south of Okinawa, to evacuate to even more remote islands in advance of an American attack that never came. The Yayami people had long avoided the almost uninhabited, malaria-infested minor islands, to which some 32,000 of them were now sent. About half contracted the disease, nearly 4,000 fatally. Claiming no legal proof exists of its culpability, Tokyo has never paid compensation. On Zamami Island in the Karamas, natives were ordered to take their own lives after the American landing the week before Elde. 171 people obeyed, most using razors and knives. Some 150 farming and fishing families used hand grenades distributed by the local policemen on Tokashiki, largest of the Karamas. Some adults there survived, however, until finally the strong clubbed the weak to death, the young axed the old, and mothers suffocated their children. Regaining consciousness to see some of his family still alive, a 16-year-old boy decided he and his brother must finish them off with their hands, since no grenades remained. We had to do it because of love. When I was finished, my brother and I looked around us. Our parents and sisters were all dead. Then the brothers marched out with sticks in order to die honourably fighting the Americans, as, they'd been told, all the Japanese soldiers had done. On the way, they bumped into some of those supposedly dead Japanese soldiers. The mass deaths on Tokashiki claimed 325 civilians. Garrison soldiers beheaded at least 10 more. 90% of the over 300 Korean labourers who had worked on the island under Japanese brutality also died,
many beheaded for allegedly stealing food. On Kuma Island, Japanese soldiers who'd bragged to admiring natives about how they'd defend them murdered 26, roughly twice the number who would be killed by American units when they landed in late June. The dead included a year-old baby, but a lesson had to be made of spying civilians whom Americans sent to try to persuade military units in the hills to surrender. The warriors bayoneted some traitors so that they'd bleed to death slowly. There is some evidence that the same garrison also killed several shipwrecked Japanese soldiers who washed ashore. That would have been due to intensified inter-service rivalry as the Japanese cause fell apart. Private Norio Watanabe, the Osaka photographer who had fled Okinawa and washed up on Kume, learned of the atrocities there when members of the garrison killed the husband of a young woman who had befriended him. I couldn't understand the reasoning of the Navy men who were killing villagers as spy suspects. Instead of fighting the Americans who landed, our men, full of anguish to protect their own lives, kill the friendly, cooperative villagers. But Watanabe, who had always known the folly of war with America, remained the exception even decades later in his grieving for the murdered. Those were the kinds of episodes the Ministry of Education assiduously excluded from the school curriculum, together with the Japanese atrocities in China and elsewhere. Okinawans too began killing themselves in June, because one facet of Japanese propaganda retained its power. No longer willing to die for a lost military or national cause, most civilians remained morbidly afraid of the immensely powerful enemy who still seemed the monsters Tokyo had described. Some natives so feared their torture that they felt relief when their throats were cut by relatives. While newspapers on the Japanese mainland wrote of Okinawan children dying gloriously on the battlefield, weeping parents were holding them tight as they exploded a grenade to free the family of the threat, or used kitchen knives, tree limbs or rocks on their babies. Japanese officers and soldiers sometimes finished off survivors of grenades that had killed the parents. Still, the majority of civilians did not choose death, but were killed by starvation, disease, individual Japanese cruelty, or most of all, indiscriminate American firing. As a whole, the dying caused more emotional torment than at Hiroshima or Nagasaki, because the agony was more protracted. Fourteen-year-old Shitsuko Oshiro pleaded with soldiers to admit her into a cave. Relenting after she promised to leave at the end of the bombardment in progress, they also admitted an older woman, angrily ordering her to stop her baby's crying. Unable to, she took him out. After a while, she came back alone. I don't know what she'd done with the child. She wouldn't say anything, and nobody would ask her. Nineteen people in a cave the size of a small bedroom left not a square inch for a middle-aged mother and elderly woman with two small children whom Japanese troops had forced from another cave. The four looked awfully tired, even to the awfully tired others. With nowhere to go, they settled under a nearby tree until shell fragments killed both women, leaving the baby still sucking at her mother's breast and the older child snuggling to her body in the pouring rain. A teenage boy who left the stifling cave to relieve himself later found them newly dead alongside their mother. I felt so bad I didn't know what to make of human lives. Thirst-crazed Japanese soldiers searching for water entered a village's last standing house, where a cloud of flies feasted on innards oozing from a collection of stinking corpses. It's the same wherever we'd go, there's no safety anywhere, the remaining residents replied to their question about why they hadn't left, and, if I die, I'd like to do it in my own home. That would be soon. More shells began falling as the soldiers left. One of Captain Kojo's men recognised someone in the carpet of civilian bodies bordering a southern road. It was young Yasu, daughter of the farmer in whose house the captain had quartered in his first position at Kadena Airfield. Bleeding to death from a shrapnel wound, once beautiful Yasu asked about the once dashing captain. Near the entrance to a cave at Itosu, a teacher and his wife sat on a rock, almost submerged in muddy water. Skin and bone, they nevertheless retained an air of refinement while remaining motionless for days, she with her head split open and full of wriggling maggots, he using his last strength to sustain a flow of comforting words to her.
A principled Japanese soldier inside the cave gave the couple the considerable gift of a drink of clean water just drawn from a nearby spring. The teacher tried desperately to raise the soldier's canteen to his wife's lips. When the soldier, unable to forget them, volunteered to rush outside and fetch his unit's water again. Two days later, the couple were face down in the mud. Middle-aged Aishun Higa and his family saw a woman's corpse in a pond near a road leading to a village sugar mill. On her back, a baby girl of about a year was moving her hands and head. When Higa's wife said something to him about the poor dead soul, the woman suddenly raised herself from the water. I'm not dead. I'm still alive. I was hit by white phosphorus. She was unaware water was no treatment for that. And can't see. Please take my child and adopt her. If you see a friendly soldier passing, ask him to shoot me as soon as possible. Higa told the woman to come out of the pond and try to survive, but she said she wanted to stay where she was and die as soon as possible because her burns hurt too terribly. Just then, a heavy rain of shells began falling at the pond, killing Higa's sister-in-law and just missing his children. They ran to seek cover. A bullet ripped through the thigh of 14-year-old Koe Kinjo the moment he stepped outside to relieve himself. Some of the people packed inside the cave lectured him severely for his recklessness. His father was furious. Days later they were joined by a young man with a bad throat wound that leaked water when he tried to drink. The new arrival developed tetanus and bit anything he could lay his hands on, whether it was a man or a stone. He would groan and squeal in an eerie, melancholy voice and bite. The men worried that he'd hurt someone and that his wild squealing would give away their position. Since he was beyond saving, they choked him to death in hope of saving the others. Norio Watanabe tried to convince a wild-eyed civilian with two pitiful daughters to save themselves. You must have seen the Americans' propaganda leaflets, he urged the father. So give yourselves up. Let them take you prisoner. The father's desperately beaten look suddenly turned to fury. What a terrible thing for you to say, Mr. Soldier. I'd rather die than become a prisoner. Producing a grenade obtained from another Japanese for use on himself and his children, he declared that he'd just killed a third daughter, his eldest, who had been carrying the youngest of the two surviving ones on her back when a shell fragment ripped off half her face. She tried to cry, but only whistles came out. I lost my mind and strangled her with my own hands. With my own hands, he repeated, thrusting them out and watching them tremble. Watanabe, with three beloved daughters of his own in Osaka, was stunned. Who told those people to fight on until death, civilians like soldiers? I wanted to tell the father that the Japanese military men who called Americans beasts were themselves more beastly, but Okinawans were naive and I couldn't reason with him. Leaving his foxhole one mid-June morning, an American sergeant saw the bodies of about 80 Okinawan women at the perimeter of the 7th Army Division Infantry Company, with whom he'd spent the night. In an attempt to find safety, or flee callous Japanese, or help kind Japanese, the women had unknowingly touched the trip wire strung around the position and set off the machine guns. Having seen similar results on previous mornings, the soldiers got on with their business. The sergeant got on with his, helping compile the army's official history of the campaign, for which he made no notes about the women because it was an army history, so we didn't include much about civilians. Sixteen-year-old Mitsutoshi Nakajo got no food in his cave because he was considered an adult. Soon, children too got nothing because the soldiers confiscated their parents' supply of rotting rice balls. As they explained, they had to do the fighting. They said they were going on a surprise attack, but we knew they just wanted to live and get back to the mainland. The next day, they announced they were going to dispose of all children under the age of three in order to keep them from attracting the enemy's attention. Nakajo pleaded with the senior officer to let his younger brother and niece, who were among the five children in that category, leave the cave with him. Saying that the family would become spies and give away their position, the officer posted guards at the mouth to prevent their exit. Then four or five soldiers took away the children one by one, including my brother, and gave them the injection.
The following morning, the soldiers told the Okinawans they were going to dispose of the adults too, in order to save them from being crushed under the Americans' tanks when they were captured. We knew they were going to kill us all just to take our food. We were so shocked we didn't know what to say. While they were trying to think of how to prevent their execution, Americans blasted the cave, freeing the civilian hostages. When Toyojima moved from Makabe's huge thousand-people cave to a smaller one, a boy of four or five was crying near the mouth because he couldn't find his mother. When no one replied to an angry soldier's question of where she was, he and others took the boy into the cave, where Jima saw this unbelievable thing. All the civilians who saw it were crying. I actually saw them put a string of ripped bandages around the boy's neck, but it was so horrible I couldn't watch it to the end. Seeking water during a lull in a bombardment of her village, 19-year-old Haru Maeda heard her younger sister and brother calling. She found both wounded and carried them inside her cave, where they told her that a Japanese soldier had entered their little house and asked their mother a question. She tried to answer politely, but her Japanese was weak. The soldier swung his sword. Her head landed in the lap of Maeda's sister-in-law. Maeda's sister ran away with her younger brother on her back, Soldiers caught up with them and stabbed her until she let go of the boy, then slashed a wide cut in his stomach. Now, in the cave, intestines spilled from both children. Running outside for water for them, Maeda saw the body of another brother, her youngest, together with two boys from another family. They had been disemboweled. Then Maeda saw her sister-in-law's father. He was sitting cross-legged against a tree, holding his money and his decapitated head. She found the bodies of another sister and an uncle at the well. Returning to her wounded brother and sister, she held their hands and tried to make them comfortable while they trembled all over, chattering their teeth, trembling and crying loudly with pain. One took three hours to die, the other four. Before the end, they asked Maeda what she would do after they died. She told them not to worry, she'd join them very soon. She tried to do that with a piece of string around her neck, but stopped pulling because I couldn't kill myself after all. I tried it three times, but quit when the string got too tight. Then she went to see her mother's body, which the soldiers had dragged a short distance from the house. They said they couldn't help what they'd done because they were in combat. No sampling of civilian suffering in June can convey its scope, which was far greater than what the two armies bore. And although desperate individuals and small groups committed most of the atrocities, some larger units contributed. On June 19th, troops of another battalion of Captain Kojo's 24th Infantry Division made a midnight escape from their menaced cave near Maehira, two miles above the 32nd Army's final headquarters. As daylight and American troops approached and they hurried to complete a transfer to another cave, they used their swords to butcher over a dozen villagers already there, including women and children. 23. Young Okinawans hold to their duty. The evacuation of the Shuri Line left most conscripted Okinawans somewhere between the civilians and the military diehards in outlook. Once the defence was seen as lost, Older men tended to turn their attention from the fighting to finding their living or dead families. But many of the unmarried, especially among the elite represented by Masahide Ota and Ruriko Morishita, the nurse's aide nicknamed Miss Victory Day, remained as dedicated as any Japanese soldiers, their youthful energy still driven by desire to prove their patriotism. Until the general withdrawal, Ota, of the Blood and Iron Scouts, remained based in the cave of the communications soldiers near the 32nd Army's underground headquarters at Shuri. By the last week of May, when the line was finally crumbling, the morale of a few Japanese officers was doing the same. Scavenging for food one night in levelled Shuri's caves and cellars, the starving former normal school students found a container filled with awamori, the Ryukyuan liquor, with a greater kick than sake. Although alcohol was strictly prohibited, their platoon had become disorganised and demoralised enough so that no officer stopped them from swilling. Their own officer, the disagreeable intelligence lieutenant, lived apart in the headquarters complex. But Ota himself would not be disheartened. Not even the deaths of more than half his unit 
most on the roads during their delivering of messages, weakened the morale of the tough young Kuma native. However, the order to leave their cave deeply saddened the group's remaining members. Whatever the dangers, the conscripted students yearned to remain in Okinawa's heart and the repository of its national treasures, including their normal school and the 32nd Army's headquarters. But although abandoning sacred Shuri was tacit admission of defeat, they of course obeyed the order, which for them came on May 27th, the eve of Ushijima's skilful retreat. Assigned to help prepare the army's new headquarters, they were the first boys to leave, but not before Ota was startled by one of the Himeyuri girls who'd been living elsewhere in the same student cave throughout the battle. Although the two sexes were still forbidden to talk, just as before the war, a pupil who'd been one year behind Ota in Kuma Island's elementary school now approached him and broke the rule with the first and last words to him from a girl student. You boys all think it's your destiny to die before you're twenty, she whispered. But death is the end of everything, so you take care of yourself. Please don't die. Convinced the younger girl shouldn't have talked that way, it was right to sacrifice one's life for one's country. Ota felt sullied, but he couldn't help feeling flattered too. The boys then headed for their new base near the 32nd Army's relocated headquarters on the cliff above Mabuni village in the far south. Weakened by severe diarrhoea, probably from drinking contaminated water, Ota couldn't manage the sacks he'd been assigned to carry. When he fell, a Japanese sergeant unsheathed his sword. Stand up or I'll kill you! The sergeant swung and missed. A classmate shouldered Ota's burden in addition to his own, and both trudged on. At their destination, the boys would be angered to discover that some of the sacks of vital documents they'd been ordered to guard with their lives contained officers' personal effects. The sergeant's sword didn't dismay the boys, who believed the tough veteran was motivated by desire to accomplish the evacuation successfully. Later during the march, however, the sight of officers wearing civilian clothes over their uniforms prompted the shocked Ota's first resentment of the Japanese. As always, the enemy's dreaded observation planes flew overhead, particularly those called dragonflies because of their looks. Knowing pilots' ability to report every detail of movement on the roads, Ota realised all civilians would become open targets as soon as they saw through the disguise. Conditions in the far south were so bad that when Ota and a fellow communications soldier delivered a message to a cave and found it empty, except for some clothing and other supplies, they indulged a youthful impulse to put on captain's uniforms. Sleeves flapping, discounting the risk of being shot for impersonating an officer because discipline had much broken down, they left the little storehouse to return to their own new cave, and nearly stumbled into the arms of an American band directly outside. Otter had seen only one live American previously, a pilot who had parachuted from a plane shot down in the Ten Tenths air raid. Bound to a large tree in the courtyard of 32nd Army's Shuri headquarters, the pilot assured a crowd of gogglers that more American planes would soon arrive to rescue him. News of his capture spread like fire, attracting students eager for a peek at him, who, however, utterly failed to live up to expectations. The dreaded beast was disappointingly human, obviously very tired and not much older than the teenage students themselves. Someone ventured a timid hello to the helpless young captive. His weak smile in response prompted youthful grins in return and fury in a Japanese guard. How dare you smile at your enemy, unpatriotic brats! Several onlookers who had approached too near the prisoner were seized and badly beaten. Despite that, Ota's best friend, the normal school's top pupil and a passionate student of English, resolved to test his knowledge of the language. Its use had been forbidden for years. Even baseball terms such as strike and out had been given obligatory Japanese equivalents. In the dead of night, the two sneaked from the school with food and water for the grateful pilot, who seemed tortured with thirst. Ota's friend exchanged a few words in English with him. The next day, he was viciously lashed by military policemen, then drafted into the army. The boy would be killed in the fighting on Okinawa. The pilot soon escaped, perhaps with help, but was recaptured and shot. Now, eight months after that incident, 
Ota was far beyond thoughts about the nature of the American people. He simply knew that the purpose of those on the island, beasts or not, was to kill Japanese soldiers, whom they shot like ducks. His terror therefore doubled when he and his friend almost ran into the enemy group outside the supply cave, but the huge half-naked killers failed to see the self-promoted Japanese captains, perhaps because they were preparing their camp for the night. The boys tore off their new uniforms and hid in yet another cave, where, to their surprise, they found an old classmate who had deserted his unit to look after his mother and sister among the refugees. Although the 32nd Army's final collapse was still two weeks away, Ota's classmate, a normal school karate champion, had seen the light. We're going to lose this war, so come with us and try to save yourselves. There's no point in still trying to fight. What's happened to you? asked Ota, astonished. You've gone crazy! He and his friend made their way back to Mabuni, from where their unit's survivors continued delivering optimistic reports to towns and villages not yet in American hands. Approaching one such cave as an artillery barrage began tearing the area. Ota was warned by Japanese soldiers to scram or they'd shoot, but civilians called from inside the entrance, This is our cave, not theirs. Come in. Certain the shells would kill him in minutes, Ota needed no further invitation. When the enemy approached the cave's mouth before evening, the soldiers told the civilians to pay them no attention. We'll kill them, nothing to worry about. One by one they crawled out of the cave and were shot dead, but the last of them sustained the reassurances. I'm the only one left, but don't worry. I'll make sure you're safe. Shot too, the moment he put his head outside the cave, he crawled back in, spurting blood and moaning. Suddenly he raised his head and shouted, Tenno Hekia Banzai! Ota's first hearing of the call for the emperor to live ten thousand years, supposedly made by all dying servicemen. It filled Ota with such powerful admiration and hope that he had to fight an overwhelming urge to weep. Then, just as suddenly, the bloody man switched back to his fearful despair, whispering an offer of money to the confounded Ota if he'd help him. Please help him. I have a bank book. A bank book. Please. Then the thrillingly defiant Tenno Hekia Banzai, again, but weakly. He died minutes later. Ota stayed put until the dark of the night, then slipped from the cave and through the American lines. In late June, he was in a forward section of the last 32nd Army Headquarters cave, where Generals Ushijima and Cho were still in command, deeper inside. It was packed with bleeding, half-crazed men milling about in confusion and despair. Forcing himself not to acknowledge the implications of the unholy scene, Ota noticed several women, Okinawan or Korean, some ten yards deeper inside, near General Ushijima himself. Several staff officers were there changing into civilian clothes, evidently hoping to save themselves or infiltrate to the north to fight again. A captain sprawled on the ground grabbed his ankles. I'm going to die here, but please let my family know about me. Please tell them. Never having seen the officer before, Ota asked his name. The captain was unwilling or unable to answer. The demoralisation was such that no one else seemed to notice his display of broken nerve. But Ota sustained his own nerve. After all, he assured himself, this was only a battle. The rest of the war still lay ahead. Glorious Japan would never be defeated. Leaving the new headquarters cave, he realised he was now on his own. His blood and iron unit no longer existed, and individual Japanese soldiers had no more power over him except the power of their bullets. Like fishermen's nets, American tanks, planes and troops were sweeping everyone toward the island's southern tip. Something like submission to destiny took command of the youth as he waded into the water and began swimming. He had no destination or plan except to escape from the enemy. Soon the end seemed to come by itself. He slipped under the water and blacked out. When he woke up lying on some rocks, hundreds of Japanese bodies, some lashed together, Many bloated like jellyfish, bobbed on the sea and covered much of the beach. He had no idea what had washed him ashore or when, although it seemed days since he'd gone down when trying to swim.
Maybe a lucky wave saved him, or a passing soldier, but none paid him any attention now. He crawled a few yards, the limit of his capacity. Although he was certain he couldn't live long in his condition, he existed for weeks. Hiding with packs of dazed, crazed soldiers between giant boulders strewn along the beach, he slept during the day, or watched arrogant enemy soldiers at work, or, as it seemed to him, a terrible kind of play. Stripped to the waist, Americans on the cliffs above, almost certainly replacement troops, since those who'd fought the battle were being evacuated for rest and rehabilitation during that last week of June, took their time picking off the mutilated rabble below. Famished, half-dead Japanese played target in that victor's sport by not waiting until dark to crawl from the protection of their rocks to hunt in the sand for a shellfish or clam. Ota himself was starving. Ruriko Morishita, the 16-year-old nurse's aide, also refused to accept the evidence of defeat and demoralisation. The high ridge into which her Okinawa military hospital's caves were cut was a blackened lump around which hardly anything green was left for hundreds of yards. The ravages of Okinawa's typhoons seemed trifling in comparison to the reddish mud churned into craters by the deluge of shells. When key strongholds in the Shuri Line began falling, the administration sent scouts south to compete with those from fighting units searching for new sites. They secured caves for each major ward, none large enough to accommodate the three together. The first group left on May 20th, a week before the general withdrawal. Miss Victory Day followed five nights later with the last group. The thought of being left behind was enough to drive some of the seriously wounded to join the exodus. One soldier with paralysing lockjaw used all his strength to plop from his bunk, a shelf cut into a wall of his cave, into a litter elderly Okinawans happened to be carrying along a tiny passage below. Although surprised, they carried him from the cave without complaint. However, the shock of falling onto the stretcher put the soldier's body into a violent tremble. Gesturing a prayer with his functioning hand, he begged heaven for help. Nothing mechanical was available. Promised trucks failed to arrive for the patients and residue of medical supplies. The army of broken bodies set out in their rags, some expecting death, others still fantasising about victory. The shelling and recent downpours had turned the dirt roads into a crazy quilt of quagmires. Some of the young nurses' aides tried to carry patients on litters or on their backs, but since the weight would have been too much even for healthy girls on a paved road, there was nothing to do but set down the burdens after a few gasping hours and stumble on without them. Groaning men struggled to push their crutches through the mire. Even the few who knew the way became lost in a torrential rain that made the night impenetrable. Others gave up when their strength was exhausted, and all had to stop at dawn to find a hiding place for the day. Some groups took three phantasmagoric nights to complete the six-mile trek to the new caves.